hello. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Sandal, and I'm presenting this afternoon on uh, the current good manufacturing practices relating to cleaning and disinfection. Um, just so we can get an idea that um, everyone can hear me and the uh, broadcast is coming through loud and clear, please can you click on the hand symbol on the uh, computer screen and then we'll be good to go. Okay, well, uh, yes, everyone can hear me, so that's great. Thank you very much. So um, this presentation is being brought to you by Farmig. Farmig is the uh, pharmaceutical microbiology interest group and it is the leading uh, microbiology society relating to pharmaceuticals and healthcare in the world. Um, so with that established, we shall begin. Okay, so these are the areas that I'm covering in this uh, presentation. I should say that um, hopefully there will be some time at the end for a few questions. Um, if you have questions you'd like to ask, you can type those in into the uh, questions box on the computer screen. If we don't get time to answer all of your questions, if you uh, can in email info at farmig.org.uk, we will then uh, follow up your question with an email reply. Okay, so what we're covering is um, regulations relating to cleaning and disinfection, something on the selection of detergents, a little on the selection of disinfectants. We'll have a look at how disinfectants kill microorganisms. We touch on the uh, oft uh, disputed subject of disinfectant rotation. We then have a look at orientating the environmental monitoring program to assess clean room cleanliness. We we'll also have a look at uh, one aspect of uh, disinfectant um, qualification, which is the field trial, and consider what we want to achieve. And we'll also have a look at some of the key audit points relating to cleaning and disinfection. And some of these are drawn from recent FDA warning letters. So to begin with, it's important just to uh, clarify um, why we want to use disinfectants and how they form part of the contamination control program. And this is all to do with supporting clean rooms. Now clean rooms are, uh, in this day and age, designed correctly with good air uh, systems, um, but they do require surface disinfection in order to keep them in control. Uh, and as part of a robust cleaning and disinfection program, an appreciation of contamination control sources is required. So before moving on to look at cleaning and disinfection agents, it is important to consider environmental control in clean rooms and also to review the sources of contamination that might impact upon clean room operations. So looking at clean rooms briefly, clean rooms are highly controlled environments that are defined by the air quality. So what ensures that a clean room meets the international clean room standard ISO 14644 is the concentration of particulates in a set volume of air. And clean rooms are used for pharmaceutical production, hospital pharmacies, surgical units, and as part of other pharmaceutical operations. So clean rooms are clean because they are equipped with HEPA filters, that's high efficiency particulate air, and these ensure that the level of particles coming into the clean room is at a sufficiently low level. Clean rooms also have high levels of fresh air change rates. So this relates to um, the way the air moves in the clean room, and the number of times that the room replaces its volume. The generally, the minimum specification is 20 air changes per hour, which means that the air within the room changes every three minutes. Clean rooms are also designed to have efficient cleanup times. This means that if a level of particles is generated that takes the room 
above its classification, that within a set period, the level of particles drops down below the safe level. There are also pressure differentials, which help uh, with air direction to ensure that the air from the cleaner area always blows outwards into a less clean area. Then there is temperature and humidity control. And then there is also staff behaviors and the way that people gown. And finally, there is cleaning and disinfection. And cleaning and disinfection is the central subject of today's seminar. OK, now there are different sources of contamination within clean rooms. And the chart there displays um, some of those ones. And uh, people has been highlighted in red because it is the most important source of contamination. But just looking at some of the others briefly, there is air. And air carries microorganisms in air streams. So it can distribute contamination around the room. Plus, there is the risk of air from less clean areas in trailing into the cleaner area. Then there is equipment, particularly the transfer in and out of equipment. And here, some um, areas of weakness are shoes and also trolley wheels. And on the subject of cleaning and disinfection, it's always good practice to disinfect trolley wheels going from one area to another. Then there are surfaces. And here, contamination transfer is key. So it's possible to transfer contamination from um, a less clean service, service to a clean one. And there are different uh, contamination control metrics that can be looked at. And here, um, uh, Tim Eaton has done some very interesting work. And that's well worth looking up if that's an area of interest to you. And then there are water sources. And water acts as both the growth source and a vector for contamination. So it has a double uh, quandary to it. But again, it is people that um, shed the highest number of contaminants, and they are the biggest risk factor within the um, clean room. So even with well-functioning clean rooms, there is a continual need for cleaning and disinfection. So where people may shed, or where surfaces will at some point in time become contaminated, there is the need for a set regime. This webinar will now go through some of the essentials for cleaning and disinfection. So we'll begin with having a look at some of the regulations, and then we move on to having a look at some of the uh, main GMP deficiencies. OK, so to start with uh, regulatory advice, the main regulatory documents that relate to the use of disinfectants in pharmaceutical manufacturing fall under the US Code of Federal Regulations. Now, this is a legal document. So unlike um, EU GMP, which is, which is guidance, in the US, um, the Code of Federal Regulations are passed by the US Senate, and they are legally enforceable. And there are some parts that refer to, uh, as they refer to it, sanitation. But we can read that as cleaning and disinfection. And that's CFR 21, part 211, which refers to biologics. And the key ones there to look at are 56B and 56C. Then there is part 67, which refers to equipment and maintenance programs. There is 182, which refers to the cleaning program. And then 113B, which is about microbial contamination and how the cleaning regime feeds into that. There is also um, reference in the FDA aseptic processing guide. Now, obviously, this refers to uh, sterile processing only. But there are aspects in there that can be applied to any pharmaceutical or healthcare operation. Then there is a USP chapter, chapter 1072, which is a general chapter. So all chapters in the USP that are numbered above 1,000 are not mandatory chapters, but they are ones offering general advice. And this particular chapter covers disinfectants and antiseptics, which in this definition refers to 
uh, hand sanitizers. And then there is uh, the EU GMP guide, and there is a, a few clauses within the Annex 1 of the EU GMP which covers this subject. So, and here there are some similarities and there are a few um, differences. Now, what I've done next is to extract um, some of the key points from all those documents. Um, and these are perhaps the points that um, if you are facing a regulatory inspection, it's a good idea to have defined in some kind of policy and to ensure that they appear in a procedure. So, first off, uh, following on from the procedures, is the actual fact that you need a written procedure. And that appears in the CFRs and within EU GMP. It's also important to have responsibilities assigned. So who will do what? It's also necessary to um, detail cleaning frequencies, to define the methods for cleaning, and to um, have um, methods and materials defined as well. So, um, and also these need to be signed up in written procedures. Um, it's also important to um, have the uh, cleaning of equipment defined and for that to occur at set intervals and also have good control of materials relating to um, approved suppliers and the storing and handling of those materials. There is within EU GMP the requirement to use more than one type of disinfectant on some type of rotational basis. Now the level of rotation is not defined. The only thing that is, is that the two disinfectants um, should have a different um, active ingredient or a different way of killing. So in, in other words, I've referred to a, um, a, a different mode of efficacy. There's also a requirement to inspect equipment for cleanliness and damage before use. Carrying on from this, um, there is also defined in the regulations the requirement to have records of cleaning and uh, disinfection. So when was the last time the item was uh, cleaned and disinfected? How long can it be held for? What's the expiry time? Uh, or when is the point when it has to be um, re-cleaned and re-disinfected before it's used? And to have some level of traceability um, within that. There is also in a UGMP a requirement to monitor for so termed resistant strains. So this is whether there are certain microorganisms that are keep reoccurring, where there might be either a problem with the way that cleaning is being done or the way that a disinfectant is being applied, or perhaps the wrong type of disinfectant is being used, um, whether microorganisms can actually become resistant to disinfectants is a point of contention, but regularly tracking the microorganisms at least gives an indication if, say, for example, there is a high number of spore-forming microorganisms appearing, that perhaps there's something about the cleaning and disinfectant regime which isn't, um, which isn't working. Then there is uh, aspects about um, ensuring that the disinfectant and detergent solutions are themselves not contributing to the buyer burden. So in uh, EU GMP grade A and grade B areas, there's a requirement for those solutions to be sterile, either being brought in uh, sterilized by, say, something through radiation or sterile filtered in. Then there's the way that the um, disinfectants and detergent solutions are stored and uh, this needs to be defined and generally there's an acceptance that this is for a short period. Um, and then there are cleaning records relating to clean rooms. So an inspector will expect to go to room A and be told when that room was last cleaned, what it was used for and when it's expected to be um, re-cleaned. And unfortunately, the list of uh, regulations stretches on. So um, there's also a requirement to define how solutions are prepared. 
and uh, the regulations stipulate that disinfectant and detergents must be prepared in a manner which does not introduce adventitious contaminations, that's uh, cross-contamination from the environment from a person. Um, there's also uh, requirements that where the disinfectant or detergent is provided as a concentrate and the users themselves need to make that up, that pharmaceutical grade water is used as a diluent and that the solution should be prepared at the uh, optimal temperature. So um, generally in aseptic filling areas, this may probably be water for injection, in other areas purified water. In lower grade areas, there's some debate about whether another type of water can be used, but then you need to be careful about the hardness of the water, and that will feed into the disinfectant qualification. Another factor is um, temperature as well, because disinfectants um, are affected by temperature, and generally the cooler the temperature, the less effective the disinfectant will be. Then there's requirements about the methods of use. There's a stipulation that disinfectants are validated according to a particular standard. And uh, I'll touch on that a little bit later on. And then the rotational issue um, again. It also stands that um, cleaning and disinfection issues features prominently in regulatory audits. Now the MHRA um, don't go into a lot of specifics, but they do occasionally put up um, lists of non-compliances. And the last time they did that was in 2013. And I had a look at that and plucked out those ones which are of relevance to cleaning and disinfection. So in about 9% of all observations, which is a relatively high number, contamination control featured. And here, uh, environmental monitoring was a factor, and deviations with environmental monitoring invariably lead to cleaning and disinfection. There's also issues on environmental control, which also did relate to some cleaning issues, and also about minimizing the potential for microbial contamination. With FDA, uh, here the information is a bit more public. But over a 18-month period between 2013 and 2014, the um, FDA, about 16% of all audit observations in some shape or form related to cleaning and disinfection. Uh, and cleaning and cleaning, sanitization, maintenance accounted for about 65 observations and made it the eighth most common FDA finding. Um, and these included things like cleaning and maintenance records not being kept, so the, uh, there was no evidence that an area had been cleaned or the last time it had been cleaned. Um, there were deficiencies relating to procedures, so that was either having no procedure or staff were observed, say, mopping a floor and doing it in a different way to which the SOP described. Then there were a number of areas that were simply um, not clean. Uh, then there were procedures not being followed, and then there were also some um, just general processes which the inspector felt were just not up to standard. So perhaps um, the mopping procedure may not have been in parallel lines or, or some other factor relating to that. So you can see from that list that, um, and, and the previous slides that there are a number of regulations that touch on cleaning and disinfection and these areas feature quite highly from both the UK MHRA and FDA. Um, so covering a number of these areas will do you a lot of good if you are facing such an inspection. Okay, so moving on, we've summarized the regulatory information, but what are disinfectants and detergents, and what do we mean by these terms? So let's begin with um, detergents and cleaning. Okay, so what is cleaning, and how does it differ from disinfection? Well, cleaning is the process of removing residues and soil, so that's dirt, dust, protein, bits of skin and so on, 
from surfaces to the extent that they are visually clean. Now cleanliness can go further and it can be supported by the use of swabs such as maybe to detect levels of total organic carbon or water rinses and this might be applied more to uh, a piece of equipment particularly where an item of equipment is being used for different production processes um, but in general for the for the clean room then generally a visual assessment of cleanliness is satisfactory but to achieve this you need to use a defined method of application together with the use of an effective um, detergent It's also important that a surface has been properly cleaned before the application of a disinfectant. And this is because most disinfectants will not work properly if there is soil, so that's the dirt, grease or protein and so on, on a surface. So for a disinfectant to work well, it has to enter the microbial cell to kill it. And if there is a layer of um, something getting in between that, some protein or whatever, then there is a chance that the disinfectant won't get through and you'll have an element of microbial survival. So cleaning can uh, be effective in that. And in addition, cleaning can also help to remove some microorganisms that are not attached or bound to surfaces. And it can dilute down the population. And some detergents contain uh, weak uh, chemicals that have some disinfecting capability but importantly a detergent is not a disinfectant and cleaning alone does not eliminate microorganisms. So what do we mean by a, a detergent? Well a detergent is a chemical uh, that cleans by removing this unwanted matter, this soil and detergents work by penetrating the soil and reducing the surface tension and it's the surface tension that those are uh, physicochemical and electro forces that uh, allow things to attach to surfaces is what the detergent attacks and breaks down those those kind of bonds which is why um, uh, many detergents are surfactants surfactant is a abbreviation of um, surface active agent and detergents will contain differently charged ions that will also cause microorganisms to uh, repel each other and to be repelled from surfaces and that allows them to become suspended and that's quite an important thing breaking down the attachment of the microorganism from a surface because microorganisms that are suspended are can be removed to an extent by the rinsing of the detergent or they're far easier to kill uh, by the application of the disinfectant. So here um, microbiologists will talk about two different states so if the microorganism is attached to the surface then it's often called in the uh, sessile state and that means it's harder for the disinfectant to kill it. If it's detached from the surface, then it's often referred to as being in the planktonic state, which is a, a derivation of, of, of plankton floating around in the water, and they're far easier to kill. So the detergent has a, has a very, very vital role in the step leading into disinfection. Okay, now there's a range of different detergents out there and uh, the slide displays a list of some of those that are available so we have soaps, anionic detergents, cationic, non-ionic, amphoterics, alkalines, acids and so on um, and some of these uh, ones that are either um, slightly acidic or uh, slightly alkali will be useful in different um, cleaning cycles for different equipment more often for the for the clean room uh, some form of neutral detergent is, is a good idea because it's important to ensure that any residues from the detergent do not interfere with the disinfectant and stop it working uh, properly. 
So the detergent that's selected uh, must work with different types of water, especially if you haven't got variable types of water in your facility. So it needs not to be affected by hard water that would contain uh, a lot of uh, 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 lime scale or something like that. Um, it needs to be compatible with the disinfectant, so this is the reason for sometimes preferring neutral detergents. It shouldn't damage surfaces. It should be uh, non-foaming and it should be effective against a whole range of different soiling materials. So you want the detergent to be able to be good against grease, dirt, oil, protein, rust and skin and so on. And if it's used to used in aseptic areas, then there must be a means to render that detergent sterile without the loss of any of its chemical properties. Okay, so we've had a look at detergents, and now we're going to move on to have a look at uh, disinfectants. So, what do we mean by disinfection? Well, disinfection means one of two things. It either means the inactivation of microorganisms, so whilst the disinfectant is there or any residual effect is there, those microorganisms are not capable of reproducing, or it means the destruction of microorganisms, so they are no longer viable and no longer capable of replication. But disinfection is not the same as sterilization. So sterilization is the rendering of uh, an item or, or a liquid free from viable microorganisms. Disinfection is about reducing a number of microorganisms, a higher number, down to a lower number. But it does not mean that after application of the disinfectant, all the microorganisms have gone. Um, often disinfection only refers to killing of microorganisms in the uh, non-spore state. So to kill spores, a sporicidal disinfectant is used. And sometimes it's better to use um, the word sporicide when we're re referring to disinfectants that kill spores and use disinfectant for um, the killing of uh, non-spores, non vegetative cells and so on. And these disinfectants are uh, defined by their ability to meet international standards. So uh, some disinfectants, as I said, are bacteriostatic and they cause metabolic injury that halts the growth of a bacterial population. And here the disinfectant can cause selective and reversible changes to cells, uh, such as by interacting with the uh, nucleic acids in the cell, by inhibiting enzymes, penetrating into the cell wall and, and destroying it. Um, but once that disinfectant is removed or neutralized from contact with the cells, then any surviving members of that bacterial population could, in theory, regrow. Other disinfectants are bactericidal. And here they can destroy cells, and this is through different irreversible physical chemical mechanisms, including structural changes to the cell, like leakage, causing the contents to fall open by coagulating the cytoplasm or causing the cells to lise or almost explode from the outside, um, from inside outside. Now there's various ways to categorize disinfectants and uh, different books will direct you in, in, in different ways but um, generally um, one way of doing so is to divide disinfectants into those that are called non-oxidizing disinfectants and those that are called oxidizing disinfectants. So with non-oxidizing disinfectants, these tend to have um, quite specific modes of actions against microorganisms. Um, so they will target one part of the cell. Um, they generally have a lower spectrum of activity. so they might be targeting, they might be more effective against gram-negative bacteria than they are against gram-positive, for example. And in this group, um, you find things like alcohols, aldehydes, amphoterics, acid ionics, biguanides, phenolics, quaternary ammonium compounds, and so on. In the second group, we have oxidizing disinfectants. And these have generally uh, 
non-specific ways uh, of action against microorganisms, so they might kill in more than one way. And in the case of um, many chlorine-based disinfectants, no one is still entirely sure exactly how they go about killing. And these have a wider spectrum of activity. Many are sporicidal, um, but by virtue of the fact that they kill everything, they're less good in terms of health and safety because um, they are toxic, because in fact they can kill all microorganisms. So some of the um, health and safety requirements become a little bit more uh, robust. And this includes um, halogens, uh, so this would be the chlorines and the iodines, and uh, oxidizing agents like parasitic acid and hydrogen peroxide. Um, now the next diagram, I won't go into a lot of detail, it may look a little bit a little confusing, but it's just showing the uh, different ways that um, different disinfectants can kill microorganisms, and this is what we mean by modes of activity. Um, so a different disinfectant will target a different part of the bacterial cell. So it might call, it might denature proteins, cause the contents to leak out, block the transfer of um, ions through the cell, attack the nucleic acid, and uh, and, and so forth. So it just gives an idea of um, how different disinfectants function. Okay, so another question to pose is what makes a disinfectant work well or badly? So there are several factors. So for example, the uh, number of microorganisms. So disinfectants are generally more effective against a low number of microorganisms than they are against a higher number. So the greater the challenge, uh, the more work the disinfectant has to do, but equally the more chance there are of um, some of that number surviving that disinfectant application process. Then there are types of microorganisms, uh, where some microorganisms are more resistant than others, and uh, the slide shows um, a, a fairly regularly shown uh, disinfectant hierarchy chart. And so you can see there, for example, that um, bacterial endospores are very uh, resistant. Then you have mycobacteria, which um, have a very waxy outer coat. Um, then we have yeast and fungi, although some fungi can actually be more resistant than others by the ability to secrete certain enzymes which can inactivate the disinfectants. Um, and it stands that the easiest things to kill are the standard skin floor, the gram-positive cocci like staphylococci and uh, micrococci. Um, then there are the um, location of microorganisms. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier. Um, microorganisms fix the surfaces, and the bigger they are bound into a community, the harder they are to kill. Whereas microorganisms loosely attach to surfaces, or just uh, kind of a kind of attracted to surfaces but not firmly fixed, um, are easier to to kill. Um, then there is the concentration of the disinfectant. So disinfectants in general are um, manufactured or qualified to be more effective at one concentration range um, than another. And this is the proportion of the chemical, the active ingredient, to water. Variations to that concentration can lead to loss of efficacy. Then there is the contact time. And that's the time taken for the disinfectant to kill the microorganisms. That's the time taken for the disinfectant to get in contact with the microorganism, for it to traverse the cell wall, and for it to carry out its, its mode of action, its way of killing the microorganism. Um, and this can be typically one to five minutes to kill vegetative cells, but many sporicides um, take a lot, uh, a lot longer. Then there is the method of application. So both cleaning and disinfection should always be completed fairly slowly to minimize the general of particles. It's also important where possible to apply a uniform pressure, to leave a visible film of disinfectant on the surface for a set contact time. 
it might be necessary to repeat the application to achieve the required contact time. And here, um, depending on the area, particularly a uh, say a, under a unidirectional airflow or in a grade A environment, the uh, application of the disinfectant will dry, will evaporate far faster than in the standard clean room. That's always something to bear in mind when carrying out the qualification of the disinfectant. And um, then about ensuring that the surface is, is, is dry, you know, the converse can happen. So an overly wet surface um, for a long period of time can result in loss of active ingredient and water remaining behind, which where it could leave surviving microorganisms to grow. So ensuring that the contact time is sufficient and it ends up being dry is very important. And uh, you can see some examples of different uh, cleaning techniques on, on the slide. Um, there are other things that can affect disinfectant efficacy. So we have um, different concentrations and uh, different um, organisms. And uh, so this, this chart um, was um, kindly provided by um, Rachel, uh, Rachel Blount. And uh, it shows very clearly on here how the concentration will vary according to different types of disinfectants and how different microorganisms survive um, with the effect of different concentrations. So clearly their errors will lead to um, microbial um, survivors and uh, it just gives an idea of, of how sometimes the point of failure and the point of passing can be quite close to each other. Um, so the key thing there is once established, once you've shown there's a certain concentration uh, kills through the efficacy testing, don't mess around with the concentration and ensure that the staff who are diluting disinfectants fully understand what they're doing when they prepare solutions. Okay, furthermore to all this, we can add temperature because temperature influences the rate of reaction. So if the temperature is too warm or too cold, then this may mean the disinfectant might not work, and particularly too cold, because many disinfectants that are sold, if they've been tested to the European standards, would have been tested at um, around 20 degrees. So disinfectants used in cold rooms may not have the same efficacy. Then there was also pH, uh, whether any interfering factors remain behind, so that's um, not cleaning properly and having having soiling, and also I've said before the type of water can be a problem. You can put these factors together, and uh, you can see that um, time is important. So the contact between the disinfectant and the microorganism, temperature is important, can increase or slow down the rate of reaction. The type of surface will affect the ability of the disinfectant how well it penetrates and how well it kills. Physical action is important for attaching, for detaching microorganisms and uh, soiling uh, prevents things from working properly. So that's a range of things that influence the efficacy of a selected disinfectant. But how do we select a disinfectant? And this is all okay in theory, but there are some key criteria that need to be considered. And we'll have a look at those um, next. So when selecting a disinfectant for use in a clean room, what do we need to think about? Well, in most cases, we want to have a wide spectrum of, of activity. So that means you want the disinfectant to kill as big a range of different microorganisms as possible. We may want to use a sporicide, or certainly we may want to use a sporicide on some kind of rotational basis. We want the disinfectant to have as rapid an action as possible, and for killing of um, vegetated microorganisms, ideally we want to have contact times of no more than five minutes. Otherwise, that poses um, practical problems in carrying out work and getting areas ready for work. Um, if we use a second disinfection um, as part of rotation, it needs to be different, but it also needs to be 
compatible. What we don't want is the two disinfectants um, working against each other or inactivating each other. And uh, rotation, whether it is or isn't scientific necessary, is a EUG, EUGMP requirement. Ideally, we also want the disinfectant to um, work across a wide pH and temperature range. We don't want it to be any detergent residues to inactivate it. Um, ideally, we don't want disinfectants to damage the material to which they've been applied. So um, risks can arise through, particularly with the use of sporicides, to corrosion and discoloration. So the more where we do need to use more aggressive disinfectants, then there sometimes is a need to wipe down afterwards to ensure that the residues are removed. So this might involve uh, wiping down with, say, water for injection or with um, something like 70% IPA. We also need to consider um, whether the disinfectant leaves surface residues and whether we're worried about this. If it does leave residues, to what extent? And whether we need to wipe those away um, with water. Now, some disinfectants, such as hydrogen peroxide, will break down into um, water and oxygen and are non-residue, um, they did not leave residues behind whereas uh, perhaps a chlorine-based one may leave a residue and a decision needs to be taken about um, removing that residue or, or not. In most cases, it's good advice to remove the residue. Um, also consider whether the disinfectant, disinfectant is compatible with all types of surfaces, whether the disinfectant will damage the surface material, to consider whether a surface rinse is required, and whether the disinfectant is likely to be absorbed into the material over time. It might cause some longer term damage, rather weakening the material or pitting it or so on. So a lot of things into surface compatibility are quite important precepts in disinfectant selection. Um, other factors to consider include um, sterility. So for grade A, grade B clean rooms, the disinfectant must be sterile. And they can either be irradiated or filtered in. Health and safety is a key factor. Can the operator use it safely? And you know, what types of personal protective equipment are required? And then there's the environmental impact. At the end of the work session, can you simply pour the disinfectant residue down the drain? Or is that in breach of particular safety requirements? So you um, need to think about how that's going to be um, got rid of. Then there's the format. So uh, which format do you want the disinfectant to be in? And does it matter? Does it need to be uh, as, as a wipe, as a concentrate, and as a trigger spray? Are all three types useful to you, or just one? If it's a trigger spray, um, have you ensured that, that when the triggers press, that there's no risk of air going back in and contaminating the solution? And what's the expiry date of that trigger spray? With concentrates, you need to consider what type of water you're going to use to uh, dilute it. If you're going to use a saturated wipe, does that wipe shed particles or fibers? And this becomes an issue, particularly in grade A zones. And also, do you know that the wipe actually works? So has the disinfectant manufacturer provided you with information about the wipe and the disinfectant as in the wipe, or they simply provided you information about the solution, not in tangent with the wipe. So that's the key question to ask. Um, then there is um, hand sanitizers. Um, so it's important that operators working in clean rooms regularly sanitize their hands, and also do so prior to the commencement of each critical activity. And hand sanitizers generally can be divided into those that are alcohol-based, and those that are non-alcohol based. And probably it's the alcohol based ones that are more common. And these either are um, isopropyl alcohol or some form of denatured ethanol, such as industrial methylated spirits. And normally these are about a 70% concentration because alcohols generally are affected between 60 and 80% because they, the way they kill the bacterial cell 
is that the cell needs to take in what it thinks is water, takes in water and alcohol, and the alcohol kills the cell. For the non-alcohol sanitizers, then there are things like chlorhexidine and hexachlorophene. Okay, and once the selection has been uh, narrowed down, then there's the issue of disinfectant efficacy testing that needs to be considered. And this is to prove that the disinfectants actually work. Uh, and it should be noted that the term efficacy testing is preferred to validation. So all disinfectants used in uh, good manufacturing practice areas need to be qualified. And here there's a range of different global standards, although um, perhaps the most logically arranged ones are the European ones. And the European approach consists of a basic suspension test, followed by a two-part simulated surface test, which is the greatest challenge, and a field trial. Now, Farmig do periodically run webinars taking you through disinfectant efficacy testing, and there's sure to be some scheduled um, over the next year or so. And Farmig also produce an excellent disinfectant guide. And uh, if you want, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of this, then please email info at farmig.org.uk or see the website. And it takes you through all of these different tests um, in great detail. Now, the ultimate test for a disinfectant is how well it performs in the field. And to know this, to know how well it's performing, you need to know what types of microorganisms you're finding in your clean room. Now, what do we expect from uh, to find in there? Well, there aren't that many studies of clean room microflora published. Um, there is some work that um, I did, which looked at about um, 7,000 isolates from a grade A area. And it found that about 80% were gram positive cocci, about 16% were uh, gram positives, mostly non spores, but a, a few spore formers, minimal numbers of gram negatives, and few fungi. Uh, close to what might be expected, um, but that kind of profiling in conjunction with the disinfectants is important. If you are interested in reading that study, then I'm happy to. Um, Happy to give everyone a free copy of that paper. So if you email um, info at farmig.org.uk, then uh, we will send you out um, send you out copies of that. So the microbial flora feeds into the field trial. So knowing what we may or may not find helps us to construct the results of the of the field trial. And the field trial is important because it's the ultimate verification of how well a disinfectant is or is not. Now, unfortunately, there is currently no regulatory or European uh, disinfectant standard for this. Um, but essentially, it means um, establishing our frequencies and using environmental monitoring methods to assess uh, what happens after disinfection. So here we can use cotton swabs, contact plates, and ensuring that the agars that we use for contact plates and for plating out swabs contain an appropriate neutralizer against the disinfectant. Otherwise, the risk is that we will get uh, false negatives. So that's a key recovery factor. So field trials help us to establish um, how often to clean and disinfect and how often to rotate. Um, and it's important to assess areas before we apply the cleaning and disinfection process after, and also if we're leaving areas for a few days, to do some monitoring in between. So unfortunately, there's no way of getting around it. It's quite a laborious activity. It generates hundreds of environmental monitoring samples. There's need for lots of trending, lots of identification uh, to make sure there's no resistant strains. But it is important um, to do. So with the environmental monitoring, uh, what we've discussed a lot is really about ways of environmental control. Um, but we also need to continually assess the effectiveness of our cleaning and disinfection regimes. And uh, a lot of this is based on the, on the environmental monitoring. OK, so we're coming to the end now. Uh, we only had. Uh, 
an hour to cover quite a big topic. Um, so I've presented lots of different types of information and all of these help feed into a disinfectant control program. So I'm going to spend the next couple of slides just saying how all this fits together. So the important takeaways from this uh, webinar are before committing to a particular disinfectant, it's important to go through a good selection process. So we need to question, are the disinfectants used appropriate? Is the effectiveness periodically assessed? What is the scientific um, basis for the um, selection? Um, it's also good practice to select two different disinfectants, ideally with different modes of action. Perhaps one should be sporicidal and generally the regulatory push is towards this. And it's important perhaps to have a third disinfectant in reserve for emergencies. Importantly, any disinfectant used will only be um, effective if it's used at the correct concentration. So here we need to know uh, what is the lowest point below that um, that disinfectants um, are or are not killed. Um, it's important that we apply the disinfectant to relatively clean surfaces using appropriate clean room grade cloths or mops and also that we leave it for the correct contact time. Okay, so drawing everything to a close, um, what I've covered today is the regulations relating to cleaning and disinfection. Um, we've looked at regulations and some of the FDA MHRA points for consideration. We've also looked at the uh, factors for selection of detergents and what they are and how they work. We've looked at the selection of disinfectants, both manual and automated systems. We've touched on how disinfectants kill microorganisms. We've touched on uh, rotation. We've looked at field trials, and field trials is the, the ultimate test of how well the disinfectant is really going to work in practice, and how orientating the environmental monitoring program to assess um, clean room uh, cleanliness. Aspects of this have also been, um, I've also tried to cover in um, a book that I've put together as well, which is a guide to cleaning and disinfection. So um, in addition to um, what Farmig's put out, if you're interested in this, then it's also available uh, via Amazon. Um, so it remains to, that's the formal part of the presentation completed. We do have um, a couple of minutes for questions. Um, a couple have come through. Um, so um, somebody's Someone from Ireland has asked um, how long should a field trial run for? And that's a tricky one to answer because um, it depends on how many clean rooms um, are in the actual facility. And it also depends on um, the time between rotation because particularly if a sporicide is used, you get very, very different practices. So some people, um, rotate their sporocytes um, every week and some might do it um, every three months. So obviously the longer the interval between that, the longer the field trial needs to go on for. It also might depend on um, whether rooms are cleaned more than once a day or, or only once a week. Um, so I think the thing is there, you really need several cycles of information to um, capture all that information. Again, uh, someone uh, has also asked about um, the importance of um, sporocytes uh, and whether sporocytes are necessary. And again, that's um, a tricky one because there's also like the, the, the regulatory, regulatory response. So um, regulators are increasingly expecting to see sporocytes used as part of the rotation. How often they should be used and how often really comes down to uh, the environmental monitoring results and um, how often or not um, you're finding spores. So um, really that's something that you know you kind of need to review the data 
and come up with your own um, defendable and defensible um, position. Okay, and we've got another question here about um, is it really so that detergents and disinfectants or two disinfectants can interfere um, with each other? Um, the answer is yes, there, there are certainly some. Um, I think if you stray outside of the um, of the neutral detergents, then you can get um, some detergents that might, you know, if you get a particularly um, uh, alkali detergent and there may be some residues and then you're following in with a slightly acidic disinfectant, then um, there is some evidence that, that you, those kind of ionic interactions can indeed um, cause um, problems there. Okay. Um, then I've um, got another question here saying, um, is it is spraying sufficient or do you really need to spray and wipe? Um, when, in, in my experience, um, you do need to spray and wipe because it's that wiping activity that is um, really important and spraying alone is often less effective. And I think you can kind of show that in um, any trials that you might need to um, might need to do. Um, Let's get another question here about um, wet contact times. Um, so saying here in the, in, the, in the efficacy test, the disinfectant is not re-wetted. So the validated contact time may encounter uh, differences in drying. And how does this work in practice? And that's, that's again a tricky one. It sort of depends on, um, it's true that the efficacy tests don't uh, require re-wetting. But it depends on how sometimes how remote the efficacy tests are from practical situations, and whether you're using the efficacy test to orientate um, what you do in practice, or whether you have them to be to be separate. So um, again, um, I mean, sometimes it comes down to the idea of perhaps using the uh, European tests as part of a selection. So you're going to go for a new disinfectant. You might select that method, prove it works. And you establish how you're going to use the disinfectant in practice, and then perhaps go back. Because it's a good idea, anyway, to look at the most common environmental isolates and resubject those to efficacy testing, and then perhaps put in a few more um, practical situations. And then the other answer is, you know, it's the field trial. It's how you actually really use that disinfectant in the clean room that really, that really matters when it comes to the comes to the crunch. Okay, right, well, I'm afraid this is all we've got uh, time for. Uh, we're coming to the end of the of the presentation. Um, I'd like to thank you for listening. And if there are any further questions, um, then either myself or another member of the Farming Committee would be more than happy to, to answer those. And also, if you want a, um, a copy of that um, paper that I referenced or anything else, then please email info at farmig org.uk and also please regularly go to uh, the Farmig website so just google Farmig or go to farmig.org.uk and you'll see our regular program of one day meetings and webinars and broadening range of, of publications so thank you for your time and uh, this presentation has come from Farmig and we'll be back with more webinars later in the year